this week on the Back Table Podcast. And I was in a multidisciplinary surgery and I was doing a case with colorectal for somebody who was having a colectomy for Crohn's disease and the patient had a very large dermoid. And so we were addressing that and the patient was something like 48 years old. And so when we finished the, the dermoid, I said, oh, you know, wait a minute, I just need to take out the fallopian tubes real quick. And the colorectal surgeon was like, well, why? And I was like, oh, you know, because it's a very effective strategy for reducing ovarian cancer risk now that we know that most ovarian cancers, especially high-grade serous ovarian cancer, probably comes from the tube. And honestly, he like almost fell over. He was like, well, no one knows about this. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Backtable.com. And welcome back to another episode of Backtable OBGYN. This is Mark Hoffman, and again, I've got with me Dr. Amy Park. How are you, Amy? Good. How are you? I'm good. Just got back from spring break. Still trying to get back on working hours, but we have great, great guests today. I'm really excited and Thank you for finding our guests today, Amy. We have Dr. Rebecca Stone, an associate professor of OBGYN and the director of the Kelly Gynecologic Oncology Service at Johns Hopkins. How are you, Becky? I'm great. Thanks so much, Mark and Amy, for having us. Now, we're excited. We've also got Dr. Carolong Roach, the associate director for the G1 Oncology Fellowship in the Department of Surgery at Sloan Kettering, the Cancer Center and the Section of Ovarian Cancer Surgery. Kara, how are you? And great. Thank you so much for having us to both you and Amy. No, this is a topic I'm also personally very curious about, but we're here to have you guys talk about opportunistic salpingectomy, something that has evolved significantly over the last decade. So before we get into the heart of the topic, why don't we start with you, Becky? Tell our listeners a little bit about you, about your practice and how you came to be interested in this topic. Thanks so much, Mark. So I am a G1 oncologist. I've been at Johns Hopkins now since 2014. And a large part of my practice is focused on taking care of women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And as you and Amy both know, ovarian cancer is really challenging cancer to treat. It's an unusual cancer. And we can sort of talk about why that has resulted in some problems with screening. And certainly we don't have a cure for it. And both Kara and I spend many days a week taking care of patients who are affected by this cancer and suffer from it and many who ultimately die. That is really what brought Kara and I to the table. We would do anything to be able to prevent people from ever having to have this cancer. Thank you. So Kara, tell us a little bit about your practice and and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, so I'm one of the GYN oncologists at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. I'm on Team Ovary, the section of ovarian cancer surgery. So my practice is diverse, but focused primarily on treating patients with ovarian cancer, which as we all know, is usually advanced ovarian cancer. I'm focused on the surgical treatment. And for a lot of reasons, many of which are exactly what Becky said, I'm just desperate to find a way to prevent early detect if we can, but prevent primarily this disease. I'm the daughter of an ovarian cancer survivor. I come from a family that has high risk. And so this has been a a research interest of mine. So you can kind of call it a personal and a professional passion. And I was lucky enough to cross paths with Becky for a short period of time at Hopkins when we both were attendings there together. And we realized that our hearts were in the same place. And so we were in this together, even though we're at two separate institutions. Well, that's great. And again, thank you both for making time. I know you're both very busy, but we value your time greatly. So remembering the show's around an hour, talk to our listeners a little bit about ovarian cancer. When we say ovarian cancer, obviously that can mean a number of different things. But what we're talking about ovarian cancer as it relates to opportunistic salpingectomy. What types of ovary cancers are we talking about? How common is it? And as we've seen in our practice, obviously it's a bad disease, but talk to us specifically about what that means. When we think about ovarian cancer, by far and large, you're talking about epithelial ovarian cancer. And, you know, that comprises about 80 to 90 percent of ovarian cancers. And then the other small percentage is made up of germ cell tumors and stromal tumors. 
And when we think about epithelial ovarian cancer as a group relative to germ cell and stromal tumors, the epithelial cancers really are the most lethal group of cancers. And in that group of cancers, you may have heard of cancers like clear cell, endometrioid, mucinous, and then of course, the most infamous one, high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And high-grade serous ovarian cancer in the group of epithelial ovarian cancers is by far the most common. And it's a very lethal type of ovarian cancer. Somewhere on the order of 20,000 women are diagnosed with that type of cancer in the United States every year. And it really is the histologic type of ovarian cancer that we think we have the most chance of preventing with opportunistic salpingectomy. What makes it so difficult to treat? I think most of us know that there are no symptoms of high-grade serous carcinoma when it is in its early stages or early phases. I think we don't even really understand whether the, the stage progression is how the disease disseminates um, or whether it disseminates Im immediately to advanced stage when it's in its early form. So there's no symptoms. There's no effective screening test. There's been wide scale, you know, massive studies that have been undertaken to look at screening tools such as ultrasound, CO125. And while there was some signal that we might be able to find it at a slightly earlier stage, that never translated to a reduction in cancer death. And so what we have is a disease with no symptoms, no screening test. And unfortunately, as we've all seen, these patients come in with widespread advanced disease. And I think it's still a unique cancer because even though the cancer is widespread, we do still treat with curative intent. And with some of the newer developments, there are patients who are long-term survivors and some who are cured. But unfortunately, the majority of patients undergo hours-long surgery and months and months of chemotherapy and unfortunately will still recur and unfortunately die of their disease. So I think it's not so much that the biology of the disease makes the cells resistant to treatment, but it's that we have no way to find it before it's widely metastatic. So, so that's really what makes it more challenging. You know, I just wanted to just say that I remember reading that the Gray Journal article that laid out the whole rationale of why ovarian cancer, and I'm doing that in quotes right now, is disseminated tubal cancer. And it was fascinating because all of this evolved over the course of my training. I mean, not to date myself too much, but I graduated from medical school in 2002, and it's now 2023. And we did all these things like ovarian cancer screening with pelvic ultrasound and checking CA-125. And then there's the PLCO study. And then the study, I mean, like nothing helped. And actually, it, we harmed patients by going in and trying to take out these cysts. It was such a great article because it laid out the biologic plausibility and rationale for SIN and its existence because nobody really paid attention to the tubes. It was like a passive actor to like get the sperm and the oocyte together. Do you know what I mean? Can you just tell us, our listeners, a little bit more about that whole journey and of understanding, because I think that's like really crucial. I mean, I'm sort of in the stands, but you guys are in the front seats of like all of these developments of the, it's a complete change in our understanding and mindset and paradigm shift. So just tell us a little bit more about that. I think Becky should explain it because she does the best job of it. I tell patients all the time that when someone finally looked in the fallopian tube and realized that this was the origin of serous carcinoma, Everything made sense, right? That's why there's no symptoms. That's why screening doesn't work. So if this discovery actually made all of those trials of hundreds of thousands of women where screening didn't prevent deaths, it made it all make sense. If you really think about it, I agree, Kara, it was like a light bulb, right? Amy, you know, your point about these screening trials, right? All these screening trials have been structured around ultrasounds, things like CA-125 or maybe even some thinking about more sexy blood tests we can do in this day and age. But I mean, when you really stop and think about it, there's no medical grade imaging that we have that can even see the fallopian tube. I think that it's essentially time that we accept that the biology of ovarian cancer is different from that of other solid cancers. We've done screening tests in other solid cancers, right? Like cervix cancer, lung cancer, 
where screening results in a stage shift that is life-saving and that just hasn't been shown to be the case with ovarian cancer. And that may be because there really isn't an early hematogenous phase to the cancer, so where we could pick it up in the blood, that the early phase is this widespread dissemination that occurs in the peritoneal cavity, and a blood test just is not going to be able to detect that. And so, you know, the history of this is exactly what you say, which is that, you know, the BRCA genes were sequenced in the mid-1990s when sequencing was like really clunky and hard and expensive. And people like her and I's heroes, like Mary Claire King, really led that charge. I was so grateful to her. You know, once that was discovered, that really created some biologic rationale for what we know as risk-reducing surgery. So this idea that you can reduce a high-risk patient's lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer by removing the ovaries. But, you know, when we take out the ovaries, there's like no point in keeping the tube, right? Because the person can't get pregnant and the blood supply of the tube and the ovary are heavily intertwined. So the tubes just came out with the ovaries. And you're right, I think people just, they were really focused on the ovary. And then one day in the early 2000s, people began looking at the fallopian tube under the microscope and they found that there was a lot of dysplasia. And that dysplasia really looked very similar to invasive high-grade serous cancer. Then people started to look at larger cohorts of BRCA patients and, and started to find these abnormalities in the fallopian tubes. And then there was pile on lots of scientific data and even epidemiologic data, that population data that taking out a fallopian tube for ectopic pregnancy or taking out the fallopian tubes for surgical sterilization in large populations of people resulted in a decreased incidence of ovarian cancer. And even tubal ligation, too, which why, and we'll get into this later, but the literature that I've seen about performing opportunistic salpingectomy, the crucial part is prioritizing the getting the fimbria, but why would a tubal ligation, just cutting it in half, like help? You know, <laughs> well, it's interesting if you, you know, in some of these big studies, it may be that the tubal ligation had a greater impact on the endometriosis associated ovarian cancers. So the endometrioid and the clear cell that really their biological origin is endometriosis coming out of the fallopian tubes and landing on the ovary and then undergoing, you know, carcinogenesis and the tubal ligation. So in, in the in some of the bigger studies, when they really went back and subtyped, it looked like the tubal ligation had the biggest impact on the endometriosis-associated cancers, which then even lends more of a little more strength to salpingectomy as a population-based prevention strategy because you would decrease not only serous carcinoma by removal of the fimbria, but you will also accomplish that blocking of the endometriosis-associated processes. When would you pinpoint this sea change? I seem to remember it 2017 or something like that. Is that around the time where we all came around to... I can actually say I came to Kentucky in 2012 and someone like close to me was like, I think I'm going to get my tubes out. And this is a person not in medicine. And I'm like, for what? So if I was reading, like, I feel like my, my aunt had ovary cancer and I read that somewhere, and this is, again, this is not a person like, not a doctor. And I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. I would know that. I'm an OBGYN. I just finished training. But I called a couple of friends, G1 oncologists I knew from training, and like, you know, actually, we're kind of sort of starting to do that. And this person that I knew that had brought it up to me was the first person I knew, and that was in 2012, 2013, first person to get their tubes out. And it was kind of like, they were the first person to like ask their G1 oncologist to do this surgery, it was like, boom. Like the, and, and I actually brought it up. I was at a, a lecture and a ovarian cancer specialist was talking about it. And, and I brought it up and they looked at me like, who do you think you are? Ovary cancer and the fallopian tubes. I mean, it was somebody who had been studying this disease for decades. And I think the next year, there was a big, like a, a couple of slides back in their talk, but it was, it came out of like nowhere for those of us, I think, who are doing it. So yeah, I mean, it just sort of feels like it just kind of happened. Obviously, a lot of people put a lot of work into it. But I'm curious, Amy's question, what what happened? How did the sea change happen? You know, if you think back, SGO published, you know, recommendations about it first in 2013. And then ACOG put out their first practice bulletin in 2015. So that's probably why, Mark, you know, 2017, you know, would have been about the right time, right? Because usually once sort of a practice bulletin gets out, right? You have to, usually shows up in our, you know, our recertification for boards and like we read it. And then by 2017, people are increasingly familiar with it. And it was really around that time, not just in the United States, but 
several professional level societies globally really began to endorse salpingectomy as a primary prevention strategy for ovarian cancer. And you're talking about, I mean, Canada has been a real leader in this, but England, Germany, certainly Denmark, Sweden, Australia, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And, you know, that's, you know, one of Karen and I's sort of, you know, we're spending the the back end of our lives working on this. But but you're right. It it really has been over the past couple of years that there's been increasing advocacy for it. You know, Amy, to your point, I think why tubal ligation? You know, the other thing I think about a lot is why the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube? Like what is the deal with that? And you know, when you think about the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube, it's like a hotbed of missense P53 mutation. So you know, the P53 being our canonical tumor suppressor gene. And that part of our body is perhaps one of the most P53 mutated organs that we like walk around with on the daily. Why is this? It's because I think it's just getting like, you know, attacked by the ovary. The ovary is like ovulating, exploding on it every month. 14 days later, when a woman you know has her period, there's some retrograde menstruation that ends up in the pouch of Douglas. And then the fimbriated end of the tube just like sits in there and marinates and all that blood and gets all this free radical damage. And so it just accumulates these P53 mutations over time. And so anything that we can do to decrease retrograde menstruation, decrease the number and intensity of, of menstrual cycles, ovulatory cycles, whether it be pregnancy or breastfeeding or birth control pills, all these things decrease a person's lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer, maybe in part sort of due to that mechanism. All of these things, like Amy said, why would tubal ligation, why would that matter? And we had all these facts that we knew, like birth control pills. Why? We don't really know why, but we've got now this possible explanation that might tie it all together for a disease that some really hardworking, brilliant people have been working on this disease, like you said, for a century or more. To have a breakthrough like this, I mean, I'm not a G1 oncologist, but it seems like a pretty mind-blowing thing to be working on this stuff as it's happening. For a disease where we're really still kind of scratching our heads as to how to detect it early, we're really the quest for a screening test is still active. And unfortunately, we're not close to having one. This whole tube hypothesis that ties everything together has completely opened the door for prevention options or risk-reducing options. So it's really kind of wild to see this come to fruition in our careers. So can you tell us, like, what is opportunistic self-injectomy? When do you do it? How do you perform it? When are the opportunities? I mean, we're talking about hysterectomy, but my colleagues doing OB are doing it at the time of C-section and more power to them. Those veins are like the size of my finger. So like, just tell us a little bit more about it because I think you have a pan view. And then as a follow-up to that, I want to ask, when do you think we're going to see the results? I'll start by just explaining what it is. So the concept is that removal of the fallopian tubes will reduce risk. And so how do we expand the access to that option safely? Becky and I always think about it as let's start with the the safest and the most practical approach, which is when a gynecologist or an obstetrician is already there. So the opportunities then when a gynecologist or obstetrician is already there, that's your foundation of opportunity. So that instead of tubal ligation at the time of hysterectomy, certainly C-section in someone who has finished childbearing. Even if you're taking out an ovarian cyst in someone who's completed childbearing, those are all kind of the lowest hanging fruit for when the tube should come out. And right now, that's the situation where we have the most evidence. There's a really robust body of evidence that supports salpingectomy being a safe and feasible and cost-effective option in those situations. And I'll throw it over to Becky to talk about maybe, you know, all the places that we can expand it where we don't yet have data, but we're working on it. Yeah. And I mean, I think, Kara, you know, to your point, that's a large number of people, right? I mean, we're talking about 400,000 women who undergo hysterectomy in this country every year and 700,000 women who are interested in surgical contraception, so in tubal ligation. So if we, you know, as a field could really embrace that sort of universally as a chance to counsel women about and provide them with the choice to use those as opportunities, not just for surgical contraception or hysterectomy, but secondarily as ovarian cancer prevention, I think, you know, we have the opportunity to impact 
many women. Some, you know, some of the cost modeling and projections around this suggest if we were to universally adopt this and, and perform this at the time of hysterectomy and in lieu of tubal ligation, you're talking something like 2,000 lives you could save per year and half a billion healthcare dollars just with universal uptake in the GYN space. Ligature doesn't sound so expensive when you put it in those terms, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not nearly as expensive as all the suffering and the time and the surgery and the chemotherapy and the drugs and just the lives lost. Right. I've heard OB docs saying, well, we don't want to have to open the ligature during the C-section. I'm like, so what? I mean, it, this is potentially life-saving. Um, I love hearing this stuff. This is incredible. Yeah, I think this is sort of the information that we need to get out there because these are the talking points, you know, that we can use on our services and with our hospital. And there's a lot that we can do. One thing that we've done at Johns Hopkins is try to negotiate having an energy device in the uh, labor and delivery OR and negotiating with the energy companies to get the lowest possible cost per unit on energy devices. And so, you know, one of the companies that we've, we're working with, they're able to provide us with a refurbished energy device at something like $34 a device. And so that's really nominal cost. And also as a time saver, so you don't have to like, as Amy, you point out, those veins are so huge and I think intimidating. And and there are reusable devices too, not yeah. just refurbished, but we have a bipolar device that is not disposable that you could certainly use in an open case like that. I think that the what other thing that I uh, talk about refurbished devices, you know, that's one of the big impacts of healthcare on the environment is just like how much it takes to produce these devices. And we had a great talk in SGS by Kelly Wright on sustainability and climate change of healthcare impact on climate change. And if we can reuse devices, it's both cost saving and effective and helps the patient. So and does not contribute to infection. So now we have the data and lots of meta-analyses. So I think, you know, to your point about cost and impact, it's a huge deal to take advantage of these opportunities. What do you think the uptake has been? Do we have data on that? You know, if you look at the data, you have to take the data, I think, with a grain of salt because there's a lot of challenge in gathering this data with the way that we currently do billing and coding in the United States. Lots of procedures are bundled, like hysterectomy, and we don't have a an ICD-10 procedure code, actually, that is um, specific to opportunistic salpingectomy. We have one for prophylactic salpingectomy, so removal of the tubes for persons who have risk factors, like genetics or family history. But Right now, the way that we do coding in the United States and how um, insurance recognizes that a risk factor of being a woman or having a fallopian tube is not acknowledged. And so our coding actually is outdated and it's not consistent with the current standard of care. There's no CPT code either. The CPT codes that exist, one is sterilization, so it's a bilateral code. It is with transection. So you, ACOG for a while was telling us to do that, but it doesn't have nearly as many RVUs as the adnexal laparoscopic adnexal code, which is tube and or ovary, which is a unilateral code associated with pathology. And I think the vignettes for endometriosis. So you're getting a bilat. People are billing and correctly because it is removing two fallopian tubes. But my guess is CMS will step in and probably demand that we redo those codes. But yeah, there is there is no laparoscopic bilateral salpingectomy for the purposes of sterilization because most CPT codes have to be associated with a diagnosis code, right? I mean, that's so we can't just, you can't do a cancer surgery diagnosis for someone who's got, you know, a, a broken finger. It has to match up. And so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're behind on this. And this is something I sat on ACOG's Committee on Health Economics and Coding a decade ago, and it was something we were talking about even then, but it's these things take a lot of time, but th that's how new this is. So how, how do you measure the uptake? I mean, you're talking about billing data, but are there estimates at least? That's what I'm saying. If you look at the papers on this, you have to look at it with a grain of salt. I think we're doing a pretty good job of performing salpingectomy at the time of hysterectomy as gynecologists. And so, you know, I've seen estimates as high as, you know, 65 to 85% of hysterectomies. But the current data on performance of salpingectomy in lieu of tubal ligation is not nearly as good for some of the reasons we talked about at the time of C-section, but also even at interval surgical sterilization. And so some of the data would suggest that we're only at like 18% uptake. 
one of the challenging things, and, and this is part of the reason why this quest is so complicated, is that there's legal implications or policy because not the laws, state-based laws and federal laws about surgical sterilization and what you know, Medicaid and Medicare will cover are very nuanced. And there are certain states, for example, that don't include salpingectomy as a reimbursable, acceptable procedure for sterilization. And so it- I didn't know that. Wow. Right. And so there are physicians in certain states who may not be able to bill for a salpingectomy or get reimbursed for a salpingectomy for sterilization. So this kind of complicated tangle that needs to be untangled is everything from the law to the some outdated policies surrounding sterilization with Medicaid to the billing, to the coding, and to the databases. So one thing that we're trying to do and, and hopefully are succeeding in doing is to put salpingectomy into some of the national databases, like the NISQIP database, for example. If we could just include that variable, we would be able to start the collection. And so we've had to really think about this from this amazingly comprehensive approach. And so I think Becky and I have thought about things like billing and coding and laws and policy way more than we ever thought we would have had to as GYN oncologists. As I'm thinking about it, right, hysterectomy with or without tubes and or ovaries, even the hysterectomy codes won't tell you whether it was done. No, someone would have to go check every PATH report, and that's not a feasible way. Right. Wow. I mean, that's an immense amount of work for sure. But for something that, and I've heard, you know, I've heard you guys say, I mean, the way you're describing opportunistic salpingectomy, you're talking about the level of impact in reducing ovarian cancer similar to HPV vaccines, I mean, like, or, or even more so. Talk to us about how big of an impact you think this could have. Yeah. So, yeah, Mark, absolutely. I mean, you just like, you're like a mind reader. You know, so we're always thinking about when we think about public health, right, like number needed to treat. And we think it's, you know, probably on the order of or on the magnitude of HPV vaccine, you know, something like, you know, one in 300, one in 500 potentially. And so very reasonable strategy. I mean, we're talking about a cancer, a lethal cancer, right, that affects one in 78 women in their lifetime, a cancer for which we have no screening, we have no cure. And we're able to offer a strategy for prevention where we you know, remove a structure that has no former function after a certain time point in a woman's life after they've completed childbearing and you know, significantly reduce someone's chances of getting that cancer, you know, maybe on the order of 65%, you know, maybe even higher. And so when you think about like sort of just the history of medicine, arguably we've never really had this opportunity for cancer prevention ever, where we could remove something that doesn't really have any known value once they're sort of in their post-reproductive years. And so I think Karen and I, one of our biggest goals is to expand access to opportunistic salpingectomy, you know, outside of the OBGYN space as well. I mean, when you think about it, hundreds of thousands of people undergo surgeries on their abdomen um, in their post-reproductive years. You know, when people are in their mid to late 40s, I mean, that's when people undergo cholecystectomies, hernia repairs, they have colon surgery, urologic surgery, appendectomies. And, you know, we really think that those could be our additional, you know, windows of opportunity for ovarian cancer prevention. And, you know, I think, you know, one of our asks is, is to our colleagues, to, you know, our peoples in OBGYN, you know, to um, start to think about how we might be able to work together as a team, as a surgical community, to make this an option for as many women as possible. A true multidisciplinary, multi-specialty approach and multi-center, right? I mean, I think, Becky, you've got a program you guys are starting with this. Is that right? Yeah. So honestly, really started a couple of years ago. We do a lot of multidisciplinary surgery. I think, you know, Kara does too. I think one of our favorite things is working as, as a team to help somebody. And I was in a multidisciplinary surgery and I was doing a case with colorectal for somebody who was having a colectomy for Crohn's disease. And the patient had a very large dermoid. And so we were addressing that. And the patient was something like 48 years old. And so we finished the, the dermoid. And I said, oh, you know, wait a minute. I just need to take out the fallopian tubes real quick. And the colorectal surgeon was like, well, why? 
And I was like, oh, you know, because it's a very effective strategy for reducing ovarian cancer risk now that we know that most ovarian cancers, especially high-grade serous ovarian cancer, probably comes from the tube. And honestly, he like almost fell over. He was like, well, no one knows about this. You know, if you guys could just educate us about this, like we would be interested in helping with this. You know, we're very interested in these things. And then, gosh, in October 2021, I was in um, another multi-D case with urology. And I was like, hey, you know, guys, I know that you guys are moving towards organ preservation for women who are having bladder cancer surgery. You know, you're not taking out tubes and ovaries in the uterus anymore. But we really think that there might be some value to removing the fallopian tubes because that's where a lot of ovarian cancer comes from. Would you guys, you know, be interested in helping with that? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, that's really interesting. And a year later, I ran into one of their fellows and I was trying to convince her to stay at Johns Hopkins. And I was like, hey, if you stay here, you can help us with our opportunistic cell pungectomy outside of GYN. And she was like, oh, yeah, like taking out the fallopian tubes to prevent ovarian cancer. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh, we've been doing that for the past year. And I was like, oh, you got to love Johns Hopkins. Like, you know, tell them something convincing and show them the science. And, you know, they're all in. And so that's sort of how this all got started. So now the colorectal surgeons are taking out the fallopian so tube? that's sort of the direction that we're heading. Certainly urology is, you you know, already very comfortable with that. You know, Kara and I were approached by a foundation called Breakthrough Cancer to sort of pick our brains on what we thought, you know, might be sort of a game changer in the ovarian cancer space. And we were sort of like, well, we're not really sure about screening. And it's really hard to cure once, you know, women have you know, widely metastatic and recurrent disease. But what if we focused on prevention? And that's sort of where we've come and leave it to Kara to sort of talk about that big multi-institutional initiative. Yeah, so there's this organization that brought us all together is called Breakthrough Cancer, and it brought together teams from Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, MD Anderson, Dana Farber, and MIT. And they basically gave us the task of tell us what you think is going to change the world. And they gave us some individual disease sites to focus on. And so Becky and I, of course, were super excited to put together what what we thought was going to change the world for patients with ovarian cancer. And of course, our vision is that by changing the world, these people will never get this cancer. And so we've had to really put together a strategy. So one, how do we establish the scientific foundation to do this procedure? What data exists already? Where are the gaps in the data? How can we make this equitable and expand access to everyone in an equitable and fair way? And then, and we're always talking about this, how do we make sure that this is done safely and not done in a cavalier way? And so we have put a lot of time into putting together the data for what already exists. And that kind of is what we talked about before. With We know that instead of tubal ligation for sterilization and the time of hysterectomy and in the GYN OR, this should be offered to patients as much as possible in the appropriate patient, but how can we safely expand this? And it's a really hard question because let's take all these opportunities where women are having abdominal and pelvic surgeries. Well, should GYNs be coming into the OR to do these procedures with our general surgery colleagues? Should we be teaching our general surgery colleagues how to do these procedures? How do we teach them how to do it? How do we make patient selection guidelines How do we make tools to teach patients? And so for the past few years, we've been putting together basically this entire endeavor. And again, we hope that when we come out of this, we'll have a clinical trial that establishes that it's safe and feasible outside of the GYNOR, that we'll have materials to teach patients, to teach doctors, GYNs and non-GYNs. We'll have selection criteria. We'll have best practice guidelines. And so by the end of this, we'll be able to really expand access in a safe way. The last thing we want to do is for any patient to be unsafe. And so that's our first and foremost priority. I love that so much. Just my mind is blown about the multidisciplinary aspect because the whole concept, I love that that urologists just adopted it right away. But they're also so familiar with laparoscopy and specifically robotic surgery and bipolar cautery. Although I will say, and I'm saying this in a loving way, I have walked into the OR and some services have been like, is this the Philippian tube? And you're like, no, that's the round. <laughs> you know, we're the IP. <laughs> and these are things that Becky and I have thought about, right? Because if we tell the world to start taking out Philippian tubes, but there's no appropriate anatomical illustrations. And so Becky actually went to one of her illustrators at Hopkins. I'm stealing your story from you, Becky. But she was like, there's no great visual in a textbook of the mesosalpinx. It's just not 
that tubo-ovarian ligament, the little ligament at the end that connects kind of the fimbriated end to the edge of the ovary, really well described in most places. And we're like, if we're going to be telling people to do this, we need accurate teaching tools. And so Becky actually went and worked with an illustrator to come up with this beautiful illustration that hopefully will come out with some of our published work to describe these structures. Can we talk about the technique of salpingectomy? And so that little tiny connection between the fimbria and the ovary as we're doing more and more of these. I do loads of salpingectomies, whether it's for sterilization or for hysterectomy, but there's that little bit of the tube that kind of sticks to the ovary. Should we be taking out part of the ovary just to get every little bleb off? Should we be ablating on top of that? Talk to me about what we know as possible best techniques for taking out fallopian tubes. Yeah, I mean, that's part of our work is to create some teaching materials around this. Because we agree, even as, you know, when you really think about it, we as a field of surgery, of GYN surgeons, we really haven't really doubled down on this, even as a a surgical field. And so I don't know about you guys, but it's always the left side that seems more sticky. The right side is just generally easier and more free. I don't know what it is about that left side, if it's just because the colon is always just like bumping against it and like the fimbria are more likely to be fused on that side or what is the deal. But I think that's really just an interesting observation in and of itself. But you're right. We often do find that the fimbria, especially on that left side, you know, sort of stuck to the surface of the ovary. And so I do think that, you know, we have to, you know, do due diligence to make sure that we do everything that we can to get those fimbria off of there, potentially ablate them. You know, certainly some people have written about doing like a wedge resection of the ovary in that area. I mean, very aggressive things. You know, I don't think that we're there yet. But I do think this idea that you're only going to partially excise the fimbria because that's easy to do is not the right thing, that we should spend some time dissecting them off, you know, with monopolar scissors or, you know, what have you. And then I just sort of, I think to make the point is that I think we're going to learn more as we do this, as we really study this in a scientific way altogether. I think, you know, Canada is really doing a tremendous amount of work on this. And One thing that really helped this mission out is the publication that came from some of our colleagues up in Canada who've been following thousands of women prospectively after opportunistic salpingectomy done at the time of hysterectomy or in lieu of tubal ligation. And what they found is that what we know right now is that it does substantially decrease the incidence of high-grade serous cancer, but what that impact that will have on mortality you know, we need some more years of follow-up. And so I think right now, I think the message is that we've got to start sort of getting the word out, making sure we all are on the same page about the fact that we should counsel patients about this and, you know, give them choice about this and look for as many opportunities as we can to offer this safely. And then we desperately need education materials and standardization. So like for BRCA risk-reducing salpingectomy, I know that I don't really do them. I don't get those kind of referrals, but since I'm Eurogyne. However, I remember people talking about best practices and going all the way to the cornu and then really getting pretty aggressive about taking every single little bit of the tube. Now, I mean, the conversation that I have observed about opportunistic salpingectomy has not been as aggressive surrounding all of the tube. But can you guys expound on that and tell me what, you know, from your expert opinion, what's the best practice? From just a a surgical technique perspective, we discussed the fimbriated end and how challenging that is to get off. And of course, we always discuss in our ORs with our fellows, the one big mistake you can make when you're dissecting the fimbria off is accidentally taking part of the IP if you go down a little bit too low. On the other side, when you get to the uterine cornua, it's really diminishing returns when you're going and trying to dissect out the interstitial portion of the tube from the uterus. We don't generally recommend doing that because really these cancers are fimbriated end cancers. And I think when we translate that to the concept of opportunistic salpingectomy, one of the things that we always talk about is when do we tell people to stop, right? If there's bad adhesions, should we be telling people to abandon the procedure? And probably the answer is yes, because as a risk-reducing procedure in a patient at average risk, we really want to mitigate the potential harm. So for this kind of procedure, certainly getting all the fimbriated end off of the ovary is important, but probably not 
the situation to do a big wedge resection or dive deep into the ovary because that at this point, the harm is going to start outweighing the potential benefit. Same thing with excising the interstitial portion of the tube in the uterus. Probably not worth that risk. Same thing if there's bad adhesions. Somebody has bad diverticular disease and the left colon is sticking that tube down. Maybe that's the case that doesn't get the risk-reducing surgery. And these are things that Becky and I are incorporating into our research when we survey other doctors and surgeons and try to identify guidelines for best practice. But I think for opportunistic salpingectomy, it's really where you want to limit potential harm. And I think, remember, you can always go back, right? And so if that fallopian tube comes out, right, I think it's also important to label which side you took it out, left or right, for this reason, right? If once you take it out, if the pathologist, and that's a whole nother, we could talk for an hour about this, about the limitations of our histopathologic diagnosis of Philippian tube precancers, but if a stick is found or precancer is found, you always have that opportunity to go back, right? And so doing something very aggressive for talking about something that you might find in one in 500 women doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially I think as we're as we move towards improving diagnostics. Are we looking closely enough at the tubes? So I'm taking out all these tubes. I'm sure you, you guys as oncologists are going to say no, and the pathologists are like, oh, yes, no. it's fine. <laughs> hey, how long do you have for us to answer that? I know. I mean, I spent an hour on the phone with one of our pathologists on Saturday about this because I basically was like, I've heard that maybe we look at 1% or less of a fallopian tube histopathologically. And we sort of sat there and went through the math, right, of like the huge surface area of the fimbriated end, right? And many places will just sort of bivalve the tube and, you know, look at one section from each side, right, of the tube and the fimbriated end. But I mean, it's probably honestly like looking at only one star in a galaxy is like what fraction of the fallopian tube we're actually looking at. And so that's why, you know, we have this collaboration with MIT as part of our breakthrough cancer work to innovate diagnostics. I mean, in this era of molecular imaging, why can't we take a whole organ out and label it and look at it with special imaging to really target areas where there are abnormalities and focus on those areas as opposed to just like randomly sectioning an organ and hoping we find the area of interest? That happened to me. I, I had somebody I did a sacrocolpoplexy on. I took out her tubes. A year later, she comes with disseminated ovarian cancer. And they looked back at the tubes later and it was there. And then the other thing I will say in terms of best practices is how about taking out a uterus and then taking out the tubes and then the pathologist calls you and says, we didn't find the tubes. And I was like, is this a mind F? Are you, are you punking me? Like what's going on? And it, t- it, it took me one time for that to happen. Like, oh, we never got tubes. I'm like, so now I do left tube. That's what I do too. Right tube. We take out the tubes separately from the uterus. We always take out the tubes first in a hist. Then we do the rest every time and we get down all the way to the little blebs. And I do that too. I agree, Mark. It happened to me twice. And I was like, never again. Because I know what happens. The pathology tech like sections the specimen and then they prepare the slide and then they didn't catch the little piece that I got and labeled tube, I also send them as separate specimens because sometimes I'll get the path report and I'm like, this is incorrect. And this is like the gospel. But also, I just wanted to circle back and and can you tell people what stick is? Yeah, stick is essentially like stage zero or in situ cancer. So it's sort of like the tubal equivalent to like CIN3, for instance. We think, I think we have a lot to learn about stick. I think there's probably a very wide spectrum of stick. There's probably some bad acting sticks and there's maybe some more friendly sticks. And as we do really come to understand stick biology, which is part of this project, you know, the science part of this project, I think we're going to learn a lot, a lot more about them. I've been doing this now for a decade. I don't think I've done a tubal banding or a clip in probably a decade. Every single hist tubes come out, but I've also talked to some other senior surgeons over the years and As this was sort of starting up, they're like, well, you know, wait till you see the damage to the ovary and, you know, other things. So can you talk about other possible risks? We talked a little bit about the surgical risks, but what are, are there any downsides for a 30-year-old woman who's done having kids and wants it out to the ovaries, to ovarian function, to menopause coming early, things like that? I'm happy to answer this. I think that 
The question has been raised in many different instances of whether removing the fallopian tubes somehow damages the vascular supply to the ovaries, which could then damage ovarian reserve and ovarian function and result in early menopause. There are some anecdotal reports of this. There have been many studies, some of them prospective studies, some of them retrospective, that have looked at the incidence of menopausal symptoms after salpingectomy or looking at hormonal signals, AMH. And I would say that the overwhelming kind of summary of the data is that salpingectomy does not damage the ovarian function, does not result in early menopause. I, however, so I do think that if a salpingectomy is done correctly, it will not impair ovarian function, which leads me to actually what I think is is one of the major potential pitfalls that we have to think about, which is one, how do we make sure that people are doing this procedure correctly? And it goes back to kind of your questions about technique. I do think that someone who's not familiar or comfortable operating around the adnexa and around the IP could potentially damage the IP in taking the fallopian tube out. And that, we know, could damage the ovary, especially if they're having a concurrent hysterectomy. And then I think that one thing, and Mark, maybe this isn't what you were asking, but for Becky and I who are thinking about how to expand this in a population, how do we make sure that patients aren't becoming sterilized before they're ready, right? And we know that in this country, there's a very dark history of sterilization practices in patients, especially in vulnerable patients. And so how do we make sure that if we put this message out there, that patients are not having this procedure done before they're absolutely ready? And so how do we make sure that patients are getting educated, providers are getting educated, and we're teaching providers how to communicate this to patients, ensuring that they're done with childbearing? Because I think, yes, ovarian function, but more than that is is making sure that it's being done in the appropriate patient. That's such a such a great point. That's such an important point. You know, I was going to also ask, you had alluded to the Canadian data on decreasing the incidence of ovarian cancer by performing opportunistic salpingectomy. I'm assuming that people get the majority of their hysterectomies 40 to 60 or whatever, and then that all sort of overlaps with the ovarian cancer incidence. So you would anticipate maybe like a 10-year timeline of when you would see the incidence decrease? I think that's probably right. And, you know, I think that when they published that data in February last year, there was just a short follow-up of a few years for, you know, a large portion of those patients. And, you know, so I think all of us are really interested in seeing the longer-term follow-up data, not just in terms of mortality, but also, you know, confirming that, you know, it really does decrease population-level incidence of high-grade serous cancer. And, you know, also, you know, sort of going back to earlier in our conversation, we're also interested to know what happens to the other histologic subtypes of ovarian cancer. Does it also decrease endometrioid and clear cell? What about mucinous cancer? We still have no idea where mucinous ovarian cancer comes from. This question, you know, if we look at the timeline, you know, we said 2013 and 2015 were when ACOG and SGO put out their guidelines. So we're really just coming up on a decade of this being done in this country. There is an immense amount of data that I think will come out, maybe not will be the end all be all answer, but will at least shed some light on this, looking at how often we find high grade serous carcinoma in someone who's had these procedures. I mean, we know even after you know, bilateral salpingoophorectomy that you can still get high-grade serous carcinoma. So now as we're doing these operations younger, I think in the, in the next 10 years, we're going to learn so much more. Yeah. And I think to your point, Kara, I mean, I think it probably will matter at what time in a person's life the procedure is performed, right? Because sort of going back to what we were saying about the fallopian tube, sort of accumulating you know, all this P53 mutation burden in the fimbriated end, the earlier it's performed, it's as opposed to like, you think about the bladder cancer patient population I was talking about in urology. Well, those women are, you know, 60 to 70 years old, right? And so, you know, they've had their fallopian tubes a long time. They probably have a higher P53 mutation burden, maybe even, you know, higher number of precancer, precancerous lesions. But really, I think if we're gonna, if we're gonna really maximize the benefit of salpingectomy, probably it's performing it in women, you know, in their 40s before those fallopian tubes have hung around and had a chance to develop precancerous change. I mean, 
We actually think now that from the time that a precancer forms in the fallopian tube, like a stick, serous tubal intraepithelial epithelial carcinoma, that there may be as, as much as seven to 10 years before a patient develops clinical symptoms and diagnosis of high-grade serous cancer sort of as we know it now. So there's, there, is a, there is time where the disease can be intercepted. So to follow that up, do you expect that this will evolve and that this will become more than opportunistic? I mean, if this is something that, look, I do a lot of laparoscopy, I do a lot of super complex stuff, but also, you know, the easy ones are getting in and out of the belly. That's the risk, right? But once you're in, the risk of major injury from these surgeries is, is very low, especially in the hands of experienced high volume surgeons. Is this something that you think will become indicated for everybody? For, or, you know, certainly, you know, bracket patients, there are high risk patients, but for the general population, where do you see that going? So, we're, you know, it's actually interesting because there's been a lot of press in the lay media and the New York Times and the Washington Post where some statements have been made kind of advocating for this without too much explanation to follow. And Becky and I have both had a huge influx of phone calls to our practices asking just for salpingectomies without any other, you know, indicated surgery going on. I hesitate to say that I think that will become standard practice because I do think anyone who does a lot of surgery knows that surgery is is a serious business. And even minor surgeries can have major complications, whether they be blood clots or bleeding or, or infection. And I, I think that we are a long way from telling people to call their doctor and ask for surgery in the setting of average risk. And I think we have so much work to do in the OBGYN OR to make sure that this is being done all the time. Then we have all these other opportunities that we need to safely expand access in. And then only after that can we think about this as a standalone procedure. So I hesitate to say I think that's going to happen, but but maybe. And maybe if we really show that this is preventative, then it will be a safe option. But I think we're far from there. I do think one scenario where, you know, we may see practice change is that, you know, so we know that for high-grade serous cancer, about 20% of it is related to hereditary gene mutation, right? Like BRCA, for instance, um, Lynch, RAD51, CD, PALB2. But that means that 80% of it, we haven't been able to really identify the genetic underpinning. And maybe we'll learn more about genetics, maybe we won't. But that means that, you know, the patients that Karen and I take care of, right, these patients have have sisters, they have daughters who have been with us in taking care of these women for five, 10 years who've been at the bedside who when they died and the genetic testing is negative. And yet we know that if you look at the data on this, people who have a family history of a first or second degree relative who had ovarian cancer, they have a bit elevated risk compared to the general population, you know, lifetime risk. And so for them to be able to do something that might decrease their risk of of having what their mom had or their sister or what have you really is very significant that they can make a decision that they can take control that they can do something that is preventative and so i do think and and i have several of these these families and patients in my practice and it's very meaningful to them and so i do think that this that's this is sort of one pocket where we may be able to, or we have opportunity to change practice and potentially affect or impact positively, not the highest risk patients who are at genetic risk, but you know patients who have some increased risk who have watched um, or been with a family member who died of it. Yeah. And I, I could not agree more with that. I think that strong family history of ovarian cancer or ovarian cancer in a first degree relative these patients don't fit anywhere in the guidelines neatly. We tell them they they probably have a higher risk, maybe up to 5% over a lifetime, and and yet there's no place where they fall. And and I do, I totally agree that salpingectomy as a standalone procedure may be the perfect middle ground for these patients to act on risk reduction without the sequelae of a premenopausal BSO. That's fascinating. No, I mean, that, that is... You've answered a lot of my questions that I've been thinking about for a long time on this because this is something that it's new in, in this in this world. We've all been through OBGYN residency and Waldorf Fellowship, but we know ovary cancer is just, it's been this big beast. It's been this big thing that has just been, has left so much, so much 
the sadness in its wake and, you know, loss. And to think that there's actual like hope with this disease is, uh, is very powerful. So thank you for the work that you guys are doing. Thank you for sharing your work and coming on Backtable OBGYN and advocating for these patients and for women and people with fallopian tubes, because honestly, um, this is something that needs, needs to be known far and wide, not just in the OBGYN world, right? Out, outside and, and uh, anyone else who spends time in the pelvis needs to know about this. So uh, I'm so grateful that you guys were on and uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us guys and helping us get the word out. We're really grateful. And thank you for what you all do. This is a, a great resource for so many of us. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman. And Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ovrijinsky. Show notes and social media by Jody Lenora. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.